Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Goodram Show with me, Chris Goodram. Right, um, just like to say if you're watching the show for the first time, I'd just like to say hello and um, thanks for having you along. Um, why have I said that? Well, this week I've been kind of, well, kind of actively trying to sort of um, get more people interested in the show, you know, let more people know about what uh, what I'm doing. And um, the reason is that the other day Julia showed me this video um, of some woman with a, a silicon baby which poops itself. It's like, what? And it's had thousands of views and it's like, is this what YouTube has all come down to, you know, people falling over, dog videos and plastic babies that poop themselves, you know, it's like, please, you know, oh. Anyway, I was thinking my show should be having a lot more views than it actually is. Um, this is this is kind of a public information film, you know, it's not, you know, I'm not some 13-year-old with a plastic baby going, ooh, look, it's so realistic. Anyway. That's, that's that's today's rant over with. Um, what am I doing today? Well, um, I'm kind of uh, right. Well, as as you know, a couple of weeks ago, I did an, an episode of the show on uh, the Highland Laird range bottled by Bartles whiskey. So I'm carrying on looking at um, relatively new uh, independent bottling companies, ranges, things like that. Although. Carn Moor itself is, uh, or the Carn Moor range has been around for quite a while and um, I would love to give you lots of uh, really interesting information about uh, uh, the company behind um, Carn Moor, um, Morrison and Mackay, but unfortunately I have absolutely nothing. Um, I did send uh, Finn the rep um, an email asking for some information, some history about the company, but I guess he's out and about and just didn't get it. I've looked online, I've looked in books, and there's just practically nothing about this company. So anyway, um, I will be doing a, the next show uh, on um, the other range that um, Morrison and Mackay do. Uh, their cast strength bottling is called uh, Celebration of the Cast. So hopefully by then I will actually have some information about uh, about the company as a whole. But basically, you probably heard of Carn Moore. I mean, they've been around for quite uh, quite a number of years, or the range has been around for quite a number of years, and they used to be around for, shall we say, these slightly gimmicky bottlings. Um, they did 20 CL bottles, and they had a range of um, vintage dated bottlings, and uh, you had a little plinth, and so you had, you know, stuff going from, what, uh, mid-80s up to sort of 90-whatever it was at the time, and um, I never really tasted very many of them. I tasted a few, and some were good, and some were bad. Um, and um, th there was always a sort of slightly gimmicky element about it. And uh, I think a couple of years back now, they decided to sort of change things around. I think they kept, they obviously kept the uh, celebration of the cask range because that's their, their single cask, cask strength bottlings at uh, you know, natural strength, which are, you know I think um, are exceptionally good. And introduced a new range of bottlings at forty six percent, called strictly limited which is what we're going to be looking at today. And following the standard sort of procedure, I guess, of uh, um, most independent bottling companies, they're either single cask or a combination of a couple of casks, bottled until filtered at 46%, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. And pretty good value for money. I mean, with the exception of maybe the Coolila and um, a couple of the, the slightly more uh, older age statement bottlings that are in the range. They're, they're in and around the sort of 30s, mid-30s, early 40s um, you know, pounds per bottle and I think they're really, really good value. So um, that's going to be today's uh, tasting, looking at uh, the Strictly Limited range. So um, as I don't really have any history or anything else to tell you about, I'll just introduce this afternoon's sort of lineup. Okay, so I had quite a number of samples and it was fairly difficult whittling them down, but I kind of decided essentially on the ones that we've got in stock. And yes, hallelujah, we stock all of these. Um, and they are currently in stock, sitting on the shelf in the shop. So uh, uh, if any of these strike your fancy, you can certainly go online to uh, uh, the website and you can purchase them. Um, big hint there. Anyway, we'll kick off with uh, the Tamdu. Uh, this was aged in uh, an American oak hoggy, uh, distilled in 2008, bottled this year, uh, thus making it seven years old. 
The second bottling we're going to be looking at, I did have a little bit of reservations about it, it has to be said. Uh, when uh, when Finn basically said, we've got this great Glen Talkers, five years old, sherry cast, I'm thinking, okay, deep breath, <laughs> young whiskey, sherry cask, sherry punching in actual fact, so the, the bigger uh, sherry sherry casks. Uh, so this was distilled in 2010, bottled this year, like I said, five years old in a sherry punching, and it's certainly got the colour for it, you can't, uh, can't say that. Uh, we're going to then take a bit of a jump in age statements. We're going to look at this one, which is the uh, Okroisk, uh, distilled in 1999, bottled this year, making it 14 years old, and allegedly uh, port wood finished. I think it's been about six months in a well-used port cask. It's got a slight pinky hue, but certainly nothing like uh, what you would expect. So um, I think that will be an interesting one. Uh, the fourth bottling we'll be looking at is an American Oak Age Dalmore. Now, you probably know, I've said several times, that uh, American Oak Age Dalmore can be a little bit strawy, a little bit, mm, you know. And um, But, you know, we shall see what this one's like. It was distilled in 2000 and bottled uh, last year, thus making it 14 years old. And then another Lecce. Good God, you know, another one. Um, and well, as we stock it, I think that's kind of given the game away about what uh, I think about it, but obviously I'll explain that when we taste it. Uh, this was aged in a sherry puncheon, but if you look at the difference between uh, the Glen Talkers and this well-used sherry puncheon, no colour virtually whatsoever. Um, this was distilled again in 2008, bottled uh, uh, this year, thus making it seven years old, so seven-year-old Lecce. Okay, and finally we get on to the PT one. This is uh, Colila, uh, aged in a bourbon barrel uh, for eight years, uh, distilled in 2006, bottled last year. So an interesting little uh, lineup. I think you'll, uh, I think you'll agree. So um, I think it's uh, time to uh, start with the tango. Right. Okay. So seven-year-old. Uh, Tamdu, let's uh, see what the nose gives us then, shall we? Now that is nice, that's a lovely spay. Classically crisp, fresh. A little bit of honey, a little bit of barley. There's a, a, a slight spirity element to it. I mean, after all, it is only seven years old. A little bit of vanilla. But it's the freshness that I like, and that is one of the things I love about Tamdu, and one of the things I didn't particularly like about the distillery bottling, I think, 10-year-old, too much sherry, too flattened, you know, lost the freshness, and, and when you think about Tamdu, this is what you want. You want sort of like that lovely, crisp, white fruits, a little bit of barley, little herbaceous note. It's, it's just a very lovely, summery kind of whiskey, in, in actual fact, so... Yeah, really very, very enjoyable. Certainly the nose is, anyway. Well. Oh, it's got a lovely chewy malty finish. Vibrant. Fresh, alive, white fruits, a little bit of honey, a little bit of herbs. It's got a lovely, intense citrus note on the on the middle, and gives and again that kind of reinforces that sort of freshness and that um, almost mouth drying kind of character. And then some, it comes back with a little bit of honey uh, and the malty notes. And so it's it, it's not one of these ones that finishes really sort of almost austere. Um, there is certainly something there uh, to, to back it up. I mean, it's not the most complex of whiskies, like I said, but I think it's a it's a lovely summery dram, classically um, crisp spay. Oh, just just lovely, really very very nice. And one other thing I should say about it, in actual fact, is that it's not particularly expensive either, you know, so um, brilliant value for money. Anyway, on to the Sherry Glen Talkers. Um, five years old? Okay, let's, let's see. 
yeah, there is a lot of um, kind of pruney, whiny, dried fruits, but the sort of now I know Grand Talkers is a space side, but it's always kind of had more of a Highland character to me. It has that granity, minerally character which I bang on about in Highland malts, and and it's definitely got that. I mean, yeah, there's quite quite a lot of herbal notes. There's a you know, there is a lot of sherry going on, as you would expect, but, you know, Glen Talkers is just kind of punching through it, and, um, it's that lovely sort of Highland characteristic. Bit of raisinated fruit, very clean, I hasten to add, absolutely no, no sulfury notes, no off notes, um, yeah, that's, that's lovely. A little bit of honey coming out. Dark treacle, sort of, kind of, sort of darkening, shall we say, the aromas with as they spent time in the glass. But again, like I said, really, really herbal, uh, and that's obviously all coming from the uh, from the sherry uh, punching. Pal. Oh, that's a drying citrus finish. Pretty much like the nose, it's actually quite dark, it's quite treacly. There's lots of the sort of the pruney, winey, dried fruits. A little bit of demerara on the middle. Um, and then suddenly in comes the, the sort of the, 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 the hints of, uh, of the spirit character, a bit of barley, the, the sort of uh, the minerality. The citrus and it start, suddenly goes, whoa, the mouth suddenly dries up and then then after a while the kind of like the treacly notes kind of creep back in. A um, little bit of dried um, citrus rind. A little bit of smoke as well. Mm, yeah, it's actually really pleasant. Um, it's got some lovely progression, which is what I always look for in, uh, in a whiskey. And I think it certainly has a little bit more character than just being a blanketed um, sherry kind of monster. So, um, yeah, and again, not particularly expensive. So if that's the sort of thing that floats your boat, then um, worthwhile picking one up, I think. Okay, so on to the port finished, uh, or Kreusk. Like I said, I think this spent about six months finishing in a port butt, and I imagine that, I mean, even after six months, you'd expect a little bit more colour than that. There's a, a slight rose kind of hue to it, so uh, let's see if the uh, the port has any influence on the nose then, shall we? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit of kind of, sort of almost kind of rose um, petal sort of fruit. Not quite Turkish delight, but sort of in that kind of vein. Again, it's got a, a, a nice hardness to it, a grip, but the sort of the port finish is kind of just softening at the edges, a little bit of dried fruit, a little bit of wininess, and it just it goes to show, you know, that the finishing in, in different, you know, wine casks, it, it's all about the balancing, it's all about sort of getting that, that element of, um, of the finishing cask, just to add a little bit of interest, something slightly different. It's got some herbalness, some barley, taut and sort of quite tight. Uh, but that, like I said, that port port note is kind of just hanging around at the edges, adding a little bit of sort of winey red fruit. Some lovely spice as well, some coming out now, just sort of giving it a bit of coaxing and a bit of time, and uh, some sweet spice coming out, a little bit of almost sort of dusty, slightly cinnamony kind of spice, but not too intense, just very subtle. Yeah, that's that's a lovely nose in actual fact, I think. Okay, a little bit of estery notes now, a little bit of pineapple, a bit of banana. Hmm, so in actual fact, really quite complex. Um, and again, or Kreusk is, is one of those sort of malts that you just, you just don't think about very often. It's not one of the big named whiskies. And, uh, you know, good value for money, I think. Pal? Hmm. 
Hmm. Lovely Highland finish. Granity, crisp. What more do you want? You know, opens up a little bit sweet, a little bit of sugariness, a little bit of syrup, um, and there's some light, winey, dried fruit, and you're suddenly thinking, well, this is a bit, mm. and then, like with the, the Glen Talkers, it progresses really nicely. The, 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 the malt comes through with that sort of highland character, the sort of granitiness, um, a little bit of light honey, some barley, and that's how it finishes. Uh, and the, yeah, okay, the port is kind of more up front, so like I said, you're kind of getting that first. Um, and then once you're kind of into the body of the malt, so to speak, you're not really picking up those notes quite so much, um, which is understandable, judging by the colour and the supp suppleness uh, or subtlety of it, shall we say. So, um, but again, really very, very enjoyable. A lovely malt. What more can you say? Okay, and moving on to the Dalmore. Now, the thing about Dalmore is that it can be a bit of a, a bit of a grubby malt uh, when there's no sherry about. It can be sort of straw-like and earthy and just verging on that slightly dirtiness and maybe maybe sort of uh, the, the use of sherry. It's one of those things that it, you know, malts actually needs it. But then every now and again, you know, a really good bottling comes along and um, let's see if this is one of them. Now, it's got a hardness, it's got a slight, a slight industrial character almost, but oh, it's just got gubbins of, 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 of luscious honey. Um, again, some straw, some, some herbal notes. Almost, that, that herbal, herbal note is almost kind of rye-like with that slight, or slight astringency. Um, but all the while you've got this kind of honey sitting in the background, adding a little bit of sweetness, but not overly sweetening. Um, again, some, some luscious bourbon oak coming through now. Really creamy, vanilla, toffee. Mmm, lovely, absolutely gorgeous. And this is like... I keep saying time and time again, with all these kind of distilleries that have a slightly industrial style, what you want is something else there, some some sweetness, uh, just to kind of balance it up, because that sort of industrial character in itself is not exactly unpleasant, um, but when it's all, that's what all it's all about, that's when the main focus is all on this in, the industrial character, like sort of, you know, Dufftown and... Uh, um, others of that kind of ilk, feta can, for example, it's it's a bit tiring, should we say? But this has certainly got you know quite a lot going on for it. It's got a quite a freshness to it, quite a youthfulness in actual fact for something that's that's um, you know coming on for mid teens. And the sweetness is building, and it's you're starting to sort of pick up more on that that the honey and the slight crystalline sugary kind of note which kind of overrides the whole sort of slightly industrial character of the spirit. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, a bit of, bit of almost kind of sort of green fruit, possibly, you know, slightly, slightly tropical green fruit. Hmm, about. It's a little austere on the finish, it has to be said, but again, it's got a lovely highlandy granite character. Um, a little bit of salt now, I'm getting right on the very finish. Uh, a little bit of straw. Again, it's quite sort of, quite fleshy and quite fruity actually up front in that kind of slightly industrial kind of sort of way. It's not a, a sort of a Glen Academy kind of fruit monster, it's more reserved, slightly um, earthier kind of uh, fruit character. 
but it's actually got some lovely depth to it. Not quite so much oak coming through on the palette, but there is a little bit there that's that's just adding a little bit of uh, vanilla softness. Um, but oh, that's got a got a granity finish with a little bit of a honey character, a little bit of um, almost acacia honey, but not overly sweet because the sort of the granitiness is kind of keeping the sweetness to a certain extent at bay but it's it's kind of just there right on the edges so it kind of takes the edge off the slight slight austerity of the finish so um so yeah that's hmm, like that that's good right okay on to the seven-year-old leche Am I going to praise Caesar one more time? Good God, it'll be a bloody miracle, won't it? Anyway, let's uh, let's see. Fishy, briny, sweetly peated. There's a touch of of distillery character, but just just a smidge. Um, a bit of coffee. Very, very coastal. Like I said, lots of briny notes. Some intense, youthful peat. A little bit of medicinal. You know, for seven years old, really complex. Um, maybe this was the first run after they cleaned out the stills. Who knows? Um, there's even a little bit of barley sweetness as well. I mean, you know, it just goes to show, doesn't it? You know, um, the distilleries can, you know, even when they do produce, or have a history of producing somewhat um, suspect uh, whiskey, can produce a good one, and you just wish, you just wish they'd do it all the time, because this is good. This is what Lecce should be like. Um, not hugely peated, but enough. Um, coastally, slightly medicinal, like I said, but with a, with a bit of sweetness, you know. Almost elegant, dare I say it. Damn, that is bloody good. Opens up with loads of sweet barley and soft smoke. And then the peat comes rolling in, the salt, the, salt, the dusty peat, the slightly medicinal character, the tar. Yes, there's a little bit of a cardboardy note, I will not deny that, but it's all kind of sort of wrapped up in the sort of oily, peaty kind of character. But it has sweetness and a very salty finish. And it's just absolutely wonderful. And, you know... Praise where praise is due, it has to be said, and it just, like I said, every dog has its day, which is what I said last week when uh, uh, talking about the uh, Highland Laird um, Lecce, and, um, you know, it's quite quite peculiar, you know, that, that suddenly uh, two very good bottlings of Lecce come along almost at once, and um, one is kind of a bit sport for choice and blown, up, blown away by that fact, so... Um, so if you forget the 10 or 8 or whatever the distillery bottling Lecce actually is, or whether it's still no age statement, I forget these days. I, mean, I don't really pay a great deal of attention to, to those sort of things. Um, get yourself a bottle of that, or the high and lead, but you know, either one. You know, both, both very, very good. And I'm getting a lovely coffee aftertaste now. It's like, um, yeah, nice. And finally, the second of our peated malts, the uh, eight-year-old Colila, uh, all American oak. Uh, let's uh, let's see what we get. Do you know, quite old schooly Colila with that sort of herbal, fresh, menthol, maritime kind of character. A little bit of oil, a little bit of vanilla, but it's all under control. It's not. It's not like the modern style of Colila, which is very oily and. Yeah, not not unpleasant. Um, but this is how this is how I like my coal either. Crisp, fresh, bit of medicinal notes, bog myrtle, some manure, a little bit of supporting oak, you know, it's uh, 
it's just a classic, it has to be said. Just a very, very nice bottling of Kalila. I love that manure carrot note, it has to be said. Sort of slightly coffee accent to it, you know, coffee manure, you know. Mmm. Yeah, that's that's a good nose, I like that. But it's got there's a bit of sweetness there too. There is a bit of barley, you know, it's all it's not all kind of poo, shall we say. So um palette. fuller on the palate in actual fact, a lot more barley to kick off with, um, more oak carrots coming through on the palate as well, giving it a sort of like, again, a, a, an additional layer of sweetness, that sort of vanillary sweetness. Um, probably not quite so intensely peated, more softer, more subtle, but still slightly medicinally, a little bit of tar, um, some earth, maybe not quite so manure-y. Um, nice, briny, salty, finish but again plenty of supporting um, weight of fruit and, and oak uh, so it's not all kind of like austere on the finish so really nicely balanced again th th this is probably one of the more expensive bottlings in the strictly limited range certainly the, the range that uh, we're stocking in the shop um, but and Colila bizarrely enough does seem to be quite expensive I mean it's probably something to do with Oh, it's Diageo, isn't it, at the end of the day? I mean, um, pretty much all the bloody Diageo malts seem to be, you know, slightly, shall we say, overpriced. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, they're, they're, they're selling the casks off for um, a premium. And um, so the resulting independent bottlings tend to be tend to be quite pricey. But quality, you just, you just can't argue with that. So um, that's a nice one to finish on. Yeah. Okay, so let's sum this little tasting up. Um, you know, I'm really impressed with Um It was one of those kind of ranges that I never really tasted very much of. I'd occasionally come across it um, when judging competitions and things like that. And like I said, they were probably no different to any other independent company in having their hits and their misses. Possibly, I think, they've now kind of brought their, their distribution sort of under their own roof, so to speak, and are, are certainly kind of pushing it, uh, both uh, their um, their ranges to get them out there in the shops, and um, why not, when you're bottling some really good whiskey, um, yeah, make a, make, a, make a noise about it. Um, and some of these are, you know, quite young, but, but bloody good at the end of the day. Tamdu, yeah, just classic, Young spay, fresh, crisp, just does everything that uh, that it says on the tin. In that, in, in fact, um, Glen Talkers, the uh, five-year-old um, sherry matured. Yeah, it's it's pleasant. It's got some nice progression to it. It's not the style I sort of really really warm to. I much prefer the sort of the Tamdu kind of style of whiskey. But credit where credit is due. If you like this type of whiskey, then yeah, you could do a lot worse. Uh, the Orkroisk. Now, I do like the Orkroisk, although I have tasted a few slightly less than brilliant bottlings of Orkroisk. Um, and this this one's a good one. Very, very nice. A very subtle port influence. A little bit different, you know. So, yeah, definitely worth worth checking out. Uh, the Dalmore. Um, now, I always like... Well, it's, all, it's always nice when you come up with a, a bottling of a, a whiskey that you a bit like the Lecce, I suppose, that you don't really think a great deal of uh, for one reason or another. And certainly, like I've said, you know, American oak aged Dalmore can be a bit, mm, and uh, so let's just use some sherry to kind of cover up the uh, the, 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 the distillery character, shall we say. Um, yeah, I'm probably being a bit hard, but pff, yeah, there you go. Um, coming back to this particular bottling, yeah, really nice. Like the Lecce, um, just, just a very good all-round bottling, and you know, I can't believe I'm saying that again again about Lecce, but you know, 
uh, I have no preconditions, so, you know, like I said, I shall praise Caesar when uh, he indeed needs it. And the Colila, well, yeah, kind of classic, sort of old school Colila, really, crisp and fresh, a bit fuller on the palate, a bit more, uh, bit more oak. Um, but I think sort of all round, you know, a really impressive range. And, uh, you know, I, when I tasted them, I thought, you know, definitely need to find some room on the uh, on the shelves and just shoehorn them in somewhere because, you know, there's some great bottlings at a very, very good price. You know, mid-30s uh, for, you know, an independent, independent bottling, yeah, pretty good. So it's, I suppose, in line there or thereabouts with sort of like Hepburn's Choice range and... Um, uh, the other sort of ranges of, of that kind of uh, style. So, yeah, really very, very good. Uh, that's basically about it. And um, so I'd just like to say, you know, big thank you for watching this episode of the show. And there are um, absolutely no silicon babies here whatsoever. Frightening. Anyway, good dramming and good afternoon. <laughs>